Yeah, welcome to lecture 15 and uh, what we are going to do is uh, continue the solution to the problem we were looking at yesterday okay and um, if you recall this was the differential equation which uh, we had derived okay and remember this only represents the radial dependency of the velocity profile when you consider only the periodic part of the pressure gradient okay and uh, this is in the limit of t tending to infinity. So now um, this is of course subject to the boundary condition that at r equals 1 we have h must be 0 and h at r equal to 0 must is bounded. This equation is a non homogeneous equation because you have this minus 1 appearing here, and uh, therefore the solution is going to be in the form of a complementary function and a particular solution. Okay. So, clearly, we have H has two parts H particular and H homogeneous. Okay, and now you just have to recall some of those things you did in mathematics when you were trying to solve uh, differential equations without possibly having a physical basis. You are doing it mathematically. Now you see an equation where you have a differential equation and then this has some physical meaning in the sense that it tells you something about a velocity. Okay. So let us go back and uh, I think we will first calculate the particular integral. This is the particular solution. solution and uh, clearly the particular solution is h equals 1 divided by i r omega because when I put h as 1 by i r omega, r omega is a constant, when I differentiate it I get 0 and I get uh, minus 1 and that gives me minus 1 equals minus 1, everybody is happy. Okay. But then I do not like to have this i in the denominator, I want to put it in the numerator, so I am going to multiply uh, the numerator and the denominator by i and that gives me minus i by r omega. Okay. So this tells me the particular integral, that is the particular solution. Now we need to look at the homogeneous version of the thing and the homogeneous version is 1 by r d by dr of r dh by dr and uh, this is the homogeneous solution version minus i r w h equals 0. This is the homogeneous uh, equation corresponding to which I will get my two solutions, my complementary function. Okay. Um, what I am going to do is I am just going to uh, write, I am going to make a small transformation, r is my independent variable here, I am going to seek the solution in the form of, uh, I am going to def define r squared multiplied by minus i r w equals r star squared. Okay. I, what am I trying to do? I am trying to define a new variable and get this equation in one of the standard forms that you have possibly come across earlier. Okay. The idea is when I do this transformation, you will get uh, a differential equation whose solution is the classical Bessel's function. Okay, I mean that's that's just uh, uh, redefining of the scales. So uh, how did I get this? I I basically want a coefficient of plus one here. If I get a coefficient of plus one here, this is going to collapse to my uh, Bessel's function equation. 
So, in order to get plus 1 here, the denominator scale has r squared. So, I am just saying r squared multiplied by this is a new variable. So, when I do the uh, write the differential equation in terms of r star, I would get a plus 1, that is the objective. So, since I do not like this minus i, I am going to multiply throughout by i, I get r squared equals r star squared um, times i divided by r w, okay. So, I have just multiplied throughout by i, I get uh, minus i squared is plus, so r, r w comes here, i gets there. So, basically what I am saying is my r, I am going to write as r star times i divided by r w and r star is a new variable. The uh, what is the motivation? See, whenever you do something, you need to have a motivation. Motivation here is to um, reduce the ODE to a standard Bessel's function form. Okay. And if I now instead of using r as the independent variable, if I use r star as the independent variable, what would I get? I would get 1 by r star d by dr star of r star dh by dr star plus h equals 0, okay. This gets transformed to this. Yeah, you can work out the algebra, it is not a problem. Now, this uh, has my classical solution, which is the solutions to h is basically going to be some constant a multiplied by j0, the Bessel's function of r star plus some constant b times the other Bessel's function r star. Yeah? So, there is an under root there is an under root where? R equals to r star. Yeah, absolutely correct, absolutely correct. There is an under root there. Yeah, thank you. Okay? Now, this is your uh, solution for the homogeneous part because I have just reduced it to the Bessel's function. So, Bessel, I mean you guys have done Bessel's functions in cylindrical coordinates in your math course. So, that basically I am just trying to tell you that the solution is a Bessel's function. See, since you are working in uh, radial coordinates in polar geometry, you, your solutions are in the form of Bessel's function. If you have been working in the form of uh, in a rectangular Cartesian coordinates, you would have gotten sin and cosine, your trigonometric functions, okay. Okay, what, what we are going to do is we are going to look at this function y0 y0 uh, of r at r star equal to 0 is unbounded. And what that means is if you were to retain y0, that means your solution is going to become in infinitely large. And since you have a physical problem, you really can't have an infinitely large solution uh, velocity. So, this implies that the constant b must be 0. Because if b is non-zero, then your velocity is going to be unbounded at the center point r star equal to zero, and uh, you know that velocity has to be bounded in the middle. Okay, so we use this bounded conditions whenever we are actually seeking solutions analytically. Supposing you are actually seeking a solution numerically, then you would use something like a derivative equal to zero from a symmetry. Okay, but if you are actually getting an analytical solution, then I use this bounded argument. Okay, so, um, they are kind of equivalent, but not exactly, but uh, since uh, when you are doing a numerical code, you cannot say there cannot be infinity, right. You have to have some other condition. So, what this means is I have h equals a times, in fact, this is remember the homogeneous part, okay, uh, j0 of r star and uh, so, what is my actual, this is the homogeneous part, so what is my actual h, my actual h is going to be 
the particular solution plus the solution which is minus i divided by r w plus a times j 0 of r star. I am just going to go back to r now because I know r is going from 0 to 1 okay and this of r star I am going to write this as square root of r w divided by i times r. Going back to this definition of this because I mean r is my physical quantity which I know goes from 0 to 1 okay. Our job is to evaluate A now and remember I have not yet used my other, other boundary condition. I have already used up one boundary condition which is the bounded boundary condition and I have gotten rid of B. I have got to use the other boundary condition which is the fact that H at R equal to 1 is 0 and that implies uh, H at R equals 1 equals 0 implies um, A equals I divided by R omega divided by J0 of square root of R omega by I R. Okay, I have just moved it to the, I put I S equal to 0, I put R equal to 1 and therefore that is going to be it. Okay, because this is evaluated at R equal to 1. And that gives me what my constant A is. So I can now substitute the A value back here and get the H that I was actually interested in. So the H is minus I by RW times 1 minus J0 of square root of r omega by i r divided by j 0 of square root of r omega divided by i. Okay. Remember this only tells you this is my analytical solution which tells you how the uh, radial dependency is. Now, how do I, but what I am interested in is actually my velocity, right? That is what we want to find out. This h is only giving me a part of the thing. How is my actual velocity defined? The u z, u um, 1, I think that is what I used, I am not sure. Hmm? Uh, u 1, remember, was the imaginary part of the exponential of. I times R W T times H of R. Is not this correct? Uh, you need to check your notes and tell me if this is consistent with what I wrote earlier. Okay. And um, so this is basically the time. So this basically what you need to do in order to get the velocity is you need, you have found the radial dependency, you have found the exponential dependency on time which we are assumed to begin with and now you, I have got, got h, I am going to multiply that by e, uh, to the i r omega t and I am going to calculate the imaginary part of it and that gives me my velocity and that gives me only one component of the velocity remember because there is the other component with the constant pressure gradient which gives you the Hagen Poisson. So, I got to add this component of velocity to that and then find my actual velocity, okay. This is u1 and the actual velocity is is I think u0 plus epsilon u1, is it? Something like this. I am not sure what uh, I used yesterday, so I just want to make sure. Subscripts, okay, we will just use this as a subscript just to be consistent, great. Okay. So, yesterday, so this is just trying to be consistent with the thing. Uh, so, the actual velocity that you are going to get is going to be composed of two parts. We found this 
as a result of the constant pressure gradient, get your uh, Hagen Poisson parabolic velocity profile, u1 is the imaginary part of this and then you multiply that by epsilon and you get your solution. So this is the analytical form of the solution. Now what you can do is you can possibly go to one of the software packages like uh, MATLAB or Mathematica and uh, plot the velocity, remember it is a function of Rw, T and R. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to decide what you you are interested in. If you are interested in a specific value of R W, you just fix it. If you are interested in a specific position, fix R and plot the velocity as a function of time. And uh, you can do this for different R's. You can do it for different R W's. That gives you your um, actual velocity. Now, since this is a complicated expression one may want to say like can I get a simplified uh, expression, okay. And uh, I would not call it a simplified expression, an, an approximate expression. And one way to do this approximation is to uh, invoke the fact that Rw can be either very large or very small, okay. So now let us look at uh, like we did yesterday, look at the limit where Rw is very small. Okay, and now, so this is the total solution. This is the exact solution. If you get u zero from yesterday and u one from today and put it together, but uh, so yeah. Uh, cannot a function of R star. Uh, yeah, but uh, what I've done is. Yeah. Numerator and denominator are having the same term. So no, this is with r equal to 1. The, so, it is a function. It is a function of r. Yeah. This is a function of r. Yes. This is a function of r, but this is a constant. The denominator is independent of r. The numerator has r. And uh, the way we define, this is r, not r star. r star is the way we had defined it. Okay. Yeah. So, it is a function. So, this quantity here is a function of um, definitely r. And the velocity will be a function of R, T, and R W. Okay. Now, um, okay. Can we um, get an uh, approximate uh, solution? which let us say may be valid for low R w and when I say low R w, I am talking about R w being very much less than 1, okay. Why would we be interested in, okay, one of the things I want you to do is uh, sketch or plot plot, okay, this is a homework problem for you, plot the velocity for fixed Rw and R as a function of time. So you have the expression, now you just have to go and code it, you need to go to the computer, okay. And then uh, you need to go and uh, solve uh, and get the graph. Okay, it's like just sketching a function. You can do the same thing. You can sketch the velocity for a fixed R W and T as a function of R. So this, I think, there are many packages. I, if you have a fancy for a specific package, you can use your package. It doesn't matter. Okay, but I need the uh, result at the end of the day. Uh, so I'm comfortable with MATLAB. Some people are more comfortable with Mathematica. Some people say Maple. Anything is fine. Hmm? But um, I, the reason you need to do this exercise is we are going to approximate this result, and then we want to check how good our approximation is. Okay. Clearly, um, when I say low R W, how low is low? Is it 10 power minus 5? Is it 10 power minus 10? So that's the thing that you want to know, right? There are two ways of doing, the, of doing the approximation. One is you can take this expression and you can possibly expand the Bessel's function in terms of a power series and then do the approximation. 
that is one option or rather than work with the solution you start with the differential equation itself and uh, depending on your choice you can do this okay so what we are going to do is we are going to go back to the differential equation and explain the uh, method of finding the solution using a perturbation series okay because i think that's easier in some sense rather than you because you need to know the exact form of the expressions of the bessel's function uh, and then you have to apply it so um, for low rw we seek a solution in the form of a power series in rw the idea is i'm in implicitly assuming that small changes in rw give me small changes in the velocity profile okay so what do i do i have h right h clearly is a function of rw and r okay h which is a solution to this equation depends both on rw and r those are the two parameters what we are going to do here is we are going to seek this as a power series expansion in rw because rw is my small parameter and now the coefficients will all be functions of plus so this is like your taylor series expansion or a power series expansion depending upon the level of accuracy that you are interested in you are going to keep the terms okay so now i'm doing a power series expansion in term of in terms of rw so the coefficients will be depending on the radial position r you understand so basically h remember the function of rw and r what i'm doing is the rw is in the form of this power series the small r dependency on the independent variable is captured in these coefficients so our job is very simple if i'm seeking a solution of this kind i expect that this series should satisfy my differential equation okay so i'm going to have to substitute this series in my differential equation and like we did earlier we equate terms of the same order which means uh, we equate terms of which are independent of rw rw to the power 0 which are rw to the power 1 which are rw to the power 2 okay and then i'm going to get a sequence of differential equations and i use these differential equations i solve and i'm going to get h0 h1 and h2 okay and once i get that i have an, a, a form and then i can go back and uh, substitute it here your job is to verify how good is this approximation clearly if you take one term you will have a, an okay approximation if you take two terms you'll have a better approximation to the actual value so what you're going to do is you're going to find the actual solution and you're going to find out how good this approximation is to the thing and that will clearly depend upon the number of terms you take okay so for example maybe um, rw uh, uh, less than 10 power minus 3 for example the approximation is good for first order but suppose you want to push it for a larger rw value then you may have to take a second uh, order term as well okay so just like you take more uh, terms you get better uh, uh, accuracy so let's just do this exercise of substituting this in the differential equation and i'm going to retain this as it is d by dr multiplied by h0 plus rw h1 plus rw squared h2 okay remember h0 h1 h2 are all functions of r okay um, minus i r w times h0 plus r w h1 
plus R W squared H 2. Higher order terms which I am neglecting equals minus 1. Okay. So, our strategy is now to find out H 0, H 1, H 2. If I find out H 0, H 1, H 2, I can substitute it here and I can find H. How do you go about finding H 0, H 1, H 2? By equating terms of the same order. Okay. So, if I look at terms of the order of R to the power 0, that is terms are actually independent of R w. What do I get from this one? I get 1 by R d by d R of R d h 0 by d R. Okay. And this will contain R w. So, I do not use this, but this is independent of R w. So, I get equals minus 1. Okay, that is the differential equation which I get. What about this guy to the power 1? Clearly, this is going to be contributed by this. So, I am only interested in um, the terms without the RW. What I mean is, I am not going to write the RW explicitly. This gives me 1 by R d by dr of R d h1 by dr equals minus i h0 plus uh, this guy. Is this plus? Yeah, when I am taking it to the other side, of course it becomes plus. <laughs> yeah, you are right. I am taking it to the other side. Yeah, so it becomes plus i h0. Now, I am happy when you guys correct me because then I do not have to redo the lecture. <laughs> And the second one gives me this, okay. And uh, now it is going to be plus i h2, huh? no, plus i h1, and so on and so forth. What I want you to observe here is that we are solving a sequence of problems. I solve for h0. H0 is known, okay. Then I am going to sub now the right hand side becomes a non homogeneity. I solve for H1. We have a bunch of linear equations. I solve for H, uh, uh, H1. Then H1 is known. I substitute it back here and I find H2. So this way I am able to proceed sequentially in my calculation. And so once I know H0, H1, H2, I can substitute it back here and I have my solution H, which is an approximation, okay. Um, just want to make sure I have not made any mistake. Yeah, I think everything is fine. So now, in order to solve this, we need to have boundary conditions because they are all differential equations anyway. So what is the boundary condition on capital H? Capital H, the boundary condition is that this should be 0 at r equal to 1 and so I am going to write it here. Um, the boundary condition is h at r equal to 1 equals 0, this implies h 0 at r equal to 1 plus r w of h 1 at r equal to 1 plus r w squared times h 2 of r equal to 1 equals 0 plus higher order terms which I do not write. Okay. Remember, I want this equation to be satisfied for any r w. Okay, that is the idea. When I am doing my power series expansion, this has to be satisfied for all Rw or any Rw. And this can happen only if H0 at R equal to 1 equals 0. H, I should be more smart, I should just say Hi at R equal to 1 is 0 for all I. Okay, and this implies that. So now I'm all set because that's a very uh, straightforward differential equation which we can solve. And now, since it's straightforward, I will be bold enough to make an attempt. Okay, 
and uh, get the solution. What we'll do is we'll try to get H0 and H1. I suggest you guys work it out on your own and then we can compare. So, or you can just follow me, whichever way you're comfortable. I will leave you to calculate H2. So, how do you, uh, this is, you can just directly integrate and get the uh, solution H0, okay. Um, 1 by r d by dr of r dh0 by dr equals minus 1. I can take the thing over there and integrate this out. I get r dh0 by dr equals um, minus of r squared by 2. I have r dr. I take the r here, integrate this with respect to this thing. I integrate this once, I get a factor constant C1, okay. Integrating once, once with respect to R. So, I take the R there and do this. Integrating one more time, but then I, before that I am going to bring my R below, okay. And I get dH0 by dR equals minus R by 2 plus C1 by R integrate again. What do you get? H0 equals minus R squared by 4 plus C1 log R plus C2, okay. So, these are the constants which I have to evaluate. I know that at R, R equal to 0, my log term becomes unbounded. So, I use the same argument as last time. I say uh, C1 is 0 since log of r at r equal to 0 is unbounded and I only have to evaluate C2 and that comes from a condition at 1, okay. And the C2 is therefore equal to at r equal to 0, I have h0 equal to, at r equal to 1, I have h0 equal to 0 and uh, I have uh, C2 is therefore 1 by fourth and this implies that h0 is 1 by 4th of 1 minus r squared. So, in some sense you can uh, h0 corresponds to what? The solution when rw0, okay. h0 corresponds to the solution when rw0 when there is no omega. Remember rw is omega something multiplied by uh, r squared divided by nu. So, that means there is no periodic part you can think of and so the solution is that only due to the constant part and you get your parabolic velocity profile. And basically this is what we always try to do whenever we are doing a perturbation series solution, when I am trying to expand it in terms of a particular parameter, I want to make sure that when the parameter is 0, I have a solution, okay. And then I am trying to improve on the solution for non-zero values of the parameter. Okay. So, when Rw is 0, I am getting a solution. When Rw is not 0, is some uh, small finite value, I am going to tell you the solution is going to be different and that difference, the correction is incorporated in that Rw h1 term, okay. And then h1 is what we have to calculate now. So, depending on your level of accuracy, you take more terms. So, now that I know h0, which is here, I am going to substitute it in this equation and I am going to solve for the h1. Okay. I have 1 by r d by dr of r dh1 by dr equals i multiplied by 1 fourth of 1 minus r squared. This is the governing equation for h1, okay. I am just going to put that and I think I am fine, okay. So, now I can make space clearly this is a function of r and you know how to integrate this and you can get h1 now, okay. So, I am just going to integrate this with respect to r again and what do I get uh, d of r dh1 by dr. I am integrating that equals 
i by 4 just doing it a little bit of a stepwise manner to reduce my chances of making a mistake and so this gives me r times dh1 by dr equals 1 fourth of i I get r squared by 2 and I get minus r to the power 4 by 4 okay plus a constant of integration c1 okay I, all I have done is just taken this uh, r dr to the other side and I am just uh, integrating it. I am going to do exactly what I did last time divide throughout by r r by 2 minus r cube by 4 plus c1 by r. Integrate this one more time to get h1 equals i by 4 times r by 2 minus r cube by 4 plus c1 something is wrong um, I get r squared by 4 and r to the power 4 by 16 plus c2. Same argument as last time, I knock off C1, okay, um, and I need to calculate C2, and I am going to use the boundary condition that H equals 0 and R equals 1 and get C2, okay. And uh, let me just do this, and R equals 1, H1 is 0, okay. This implies minus i by 4 times 1 by 4 minus 1 by 16 uh, let me just do this because equals c2 right and I have what 3 by 4 3 by yeah 3 by 16 is that right there is a 4 here yeah so, 4, 4 by 48, right? Equal to C2? 16. Ah, 16 for the 64. Yeah, right. That is it. So, that is my H1. S I by 4. You, know, you can write it whichever way you want. Uh, some people like to write it in a different way. 16 minus 3i by 64. You can possibly write it in a slightly better way. I, this is slightly clumsy. I got i occurring a couple of times. You can take things common and you can simplify things, okay? So, the, now if you wanted to get a more accurate solution, go ahead and get H2. But you can see that this is a very uh, um, simplified way of getting the uh, coefficients of Rw. What are you going to do now? You are going to actually go back and H is now a composite H0 plus Rw H1. I want you to see that H0 is independent of i, the imaginary number. H1 has i in it. So what is it going to do? If you go back to get the velocity, you have to do the imaginary part of the exponential e power i r w t multiplied by the h. So, this guy is going to be exponent, th that is the real term. The exponential of that is going to give you your cos theta plus i sin theta. So, the imaginary part is going to give you only the sin theta, which means that particular component is actually in phase. So, when r w is 0, your velocity is actually in phase with the pressure gradient. Whereas, when Rw is not 0, a small amount comes in, the i comes. And now, when you actually take the imaginary part, instead of the sine term, you will also get a cosine term because now it is exponential of i theta multiplied by i something. So, the imaginary part will have the cosine term now. 
Okay. So, this is going to give you that out of phase uh, component of the velocity. So, I mean that is one way for you to actually figure out why when you have a finite value of Rw, you have an out of phase uh, component. So, I think this becomes very clear here. So, this is something which you should, I uh, let me write this down. So, um, clearly u is the imaginary part of e power i r w t times h 0 plus r w h 1, okay. I mean I am neglecting all the uh, higher order terms. So, this is the imaginary part of what? Cosine r w t plus i sin r w t multiplied by h 0 plus r w. Remember r w actually has, uh, no sorry, r w does not have it, h 1. Point I am trying to make here is h 0 is real. So, this multiplied by this is going to give me real part. I am not interested in that. This multiplied by this gives me the imaginary part. So, this is going to be of the form, this is of the form sin r w t multiplied by h 0, okay. So, this h 0 is contributing to my in phase part. So, this is in phase, this is in phase. What about this guy? When I, this remember has the i in it. So, I, I multiplied by this is the real part. So, I am not interested in that. I multiplied by this gives me the imaginary part which is the cosine part. So, this is basically going to have a cosine component times something, okay, some function of r. So, this gives you the out of phase. So, what I am trying to tell you is and remember this is multiplied by r w. So, this is the out of phase part. So, an r w is very, very low, the out of phase part will go off. The more the r w, the more the out of phase component, okay. So, that is basically for you to understand. So, what you people will be doing is actually finding out the solution using this approximation, finding out the solution using the exact solution and making a comparison. Just like you know what we did for the quadratic equation, the quadratic equation you have the exact solution in terms of the discriminant. Then you have the binomial series expansion or the, or the uh, power series uh, uh, that we actually did and then you can compare for how accurate is this thing for different epsilons. See only when you do that you will get an idea because I am saying epsilon is low, I am saying Rw is low, but how low is low? That is going to depend upon the problem, upon the specific problem. For some problems, Rw may be low is 10, for some problems Rw low could be 10 power minus 5. So, how do you figure that out? Only by doing this comparison. So, how good is your perturbation series solution and uh, because if it is very, very low then possibly this approach is not very good. But supposing retaining the two terms, I am able to push to Rw equals 5, 10, 50, the more the better, then I am happy with it. Okay, but then this can only be done when you actually sit down and do an actual calculation. So that's what you people are going to do: do an actual calculation and then verify how uh, low is low. Um, I think one last thing I want to do, and then uh, we'll stop. Somewhere in the beginning, I chose my time scale as uh, r squared divided by the kinematic viscosity, okay. Um, I want to go back to making the equation dimensionless, okay. And I told you that there were two possible choices of making the, the equation dimensionless because you had two choices for the time scale, okay. Uh, what was the equation we had? Rho t equals g0 1 plus epsilon sin omega t plus mu by r d by dr 
of r du by dr. That is the equation we began with ok. I mean assuming that they have only uh, the axial component of velocity only varying in r and t. I am going to just I am going to keep the velocity scale and the length scale the same ok because length scale clearly r there is nothing else happening and uh, velocity is going to be decided by the pressure ok. But if we choose the time scale the characteristic time as 1 by omega instead of of uh, r squared divided by nu this is what we did earlier r squared divided by nu is what we did earlier. What you are going to see and I am just going to write this here you will have um, and you can do this ok <laughs> keep all other keep all other scales the same you would get in a dimensionless form t the following equation the following equation <laughs> equals uh, ok. So, you know by choosing a different scale I just wanted you to understand that I told you earlier that the scales can be chosen in different ways I am choosing it this way now. The advantage of so anyway there is one parameter which occurs it is not that this rw has disappeared one parameter will occur and this is again the ratio of the same time scales ok. This guy now is multiplying my inertial term. Now, it is possibly easy for you to see that when r w is 0 when, uh, when r w is very very low the inertial component is not going to be significant in my earlier formulation I could not see that. Now, I can see that when r w is 0 this guy is going to get knocked off ok. So, when r w is 0 this guy goes off and remember this was the guy who was uh, creating a problem with the out of phase component if this goes off then I can actually solve for the velocity and I can get my velocity directly ok. So, basically what I am saying is here in this formulation here r w equal to 0 knocks off the inertial term and so the velocity is in phase with the delta p. So, possibly by doing this scaling you can instead of solving it and then trying to understand whether it is in phase or out of phase even by looking at the differential equation you can actually make this conclusion. So, whenever you are solving any problem you need to be able to actually you need to actually work out by choosing different time scales and see what kind of information you are getting ok. Because there is a lot of information by uh, choosing the uh, right scales or different scales and that gives you some insight into the problem ok. Yeah, let us stop. Thanks. <laughs>